Philosophy Podcast, a podcast where a couple of fools grab some cold ones and talk by the fire. So crack a cold one, come sit by the fire, and get a few laughs as we discuss everything from the meaning of life, space travel, and weird moments in history. I have a hypothetical for you. What if one of the greatest empires of the world built and made a wall to keep out murderers and other dangerous people? Would you be okay with that? No, it's not the U.S.-Mexico border. I know what you were thinking, and you should be ashamed, but we will get into that. Before, Mike, how are you doing, and what are you drinking? Oh, I'm very happy we're doing this episode, and I got some Old Forester to company, accompany me. But what about you, Nick? How are you doing? What are you drinking? Uh, a classic I haven't had in a while, but some American Prairie bourbon. That is good. Exactly. So if you're wondering, the border we were talking about was the Hadrian Wall. There's also a lot of borders that do essentially the same thing. So borders, how do we define them? (laughs) No, not that store that closed down a decade ago. (laughs) Which kind of made searching for some of these sources hard. Like, I don't really care about the history of borders. (laughs) I'm so happy you had that same problem. (laughs) So... Not just humans, but everyone uses borders to define things. We we call them different things, but I mean, our house, you know, a a piece of property has borders. There's natural borders, barriers like mountains, rivers, streams, and in the past, that's most likely what we use. I mean, if you look at some of the land deeds to property in the colonial areas, it's like along the brick wall and then ending at the large oak tree. It's 200 years later. There's probably no more brick wall and there's probably no more oak tree. So now the surveyor has to go back and figure out what someone was talking about. Good luck. But like I said, I want to start this talk about borders talking about animals because animals, they are territorial, you know, and different animals mark their territory in different ways. The size of an animal's territory is going to depend on a lot of things. The most the biggest factor is going to be whatever animal it is, but other than that, it's going to be, you know, distance to water, the availability of food resources, stuff like that. Um, the most common ways that we know about, like when we think of animal marking its territory, we think of a dog peeing on a fire hydrant. And scent marking is a big thing in the animal kingdom. There's other ones too, like visual, you know, certain rhinos will scuff up the ground or a tree or something a certain way. Which is kind of interesting because apparently these rhinos are hard of vision, but yet they still mark their territory visually, which is kind of weird. Did you just say hard of vision? What's the right term? Like they can't see well? I, I was going to say they're they're bit on the blind end or they can't see <laughs> movement or their eyesight is poor. But yeah, I... <laughs> what, what so this just came to my head. I was just putting out words. Don't judge me. <laughs> But yeah, other than that, birds, you know, making noises, calling at people. I mean, obviously birds aren't real, but the birds mark their territory. And then obviously you you get to like, you know, uh, chimps and, and monkeys will form territories and then not like build borders to defend them in certain places. Not Not all the time, but you do see that. And the whole point of this is we're not getting too far into how different species mark their territories, but... It's not really a human thing. Everyone wants a piece of the pie, and they want claims to it. Everything from from insects to humans. One way or the other, we want what's ours. Or yours, which is another reason why borders <laughs> are important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very good point. You got some uh, good whiskey in your land over there, Nick. It'd be a shame if uh, someone were to ride in with the Mongol horde and attack your shitty wall. And there we go. <laughs> <laughs> First South Park reference. Didn't take long. Gonna be, didn't take long. We were discussing before how long it would, how much whiskey it would take to start quoting South Park, and it turns out almost none. <laughs> All right. So now to what we care about humans. How do we mark territory? And it really depends on your culture. Now, if you look back at it, it's, tar- it's not a time thing. It's not like, well, Around 4,500 years before Christ, we just started creating border walls, which if you look at the city of Ur and and Uruk, they did do that around that time frame. But you can go all the way into the when Europe was settling the new world 
And a lot of those tribes still had flimsy boundaries of what uh, more like the boundaries in, you know, Roman era where some places had very defined boundaries, but some had kind of a frontier and we'll kind of almost no so we'll man's kind of talk land. about that almost. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the analogy for um, Native Americans, both in Northern America and Southern America, I would say is somewhat similar comparison to the Roman Empire. Where you realize the Roman Empire stretches to, I don't know, Gaul, but you don't really have exact markers in the forest. Like on the other side of, of the Roman Empire, in Britain, with the Hadrian's Wall, you have a physical boundary. From what I could tell from the Aztec, Mayans, Incas, all, uh, Native Americans writing in the, in the Midwest, is it just had more of a, a region. It's like, okay, you have this river, you have this mountain, this is kind of their territory. No major physical markers now that being said villagers definitely had their own markers like you know uh, a flag a skull on a spike uh some some type of sign to like this is our territory but that was like major pathways it wasn't like a defined border i guess i guess though territory and border are very interchangeable they're different depending on the context of history yeah, so there's a few terms people use to describe these kind of areas. So you have borderlands, and that's, say, where, you know, you got, like you said, you got Rome, the Roman Empire, and then you got the Gauls, and you got this kind of no man's land. And then say you have, and so there's two two kind of sides. Now, you don't have, there's no line. There's no line in the sand that says this side Rome, this side barbarians. But then you have like a frontier, and that's where you have, this is kind of where the Roman Empire kind of peters out. You know, these people, depending on the day, they may say they're part of Rome, may not, but that's a frontier. And then the other side, you don't, it's not like you have another side at pressing. There's kind of just no one there. So that's kind of a frontier where it's not, it just kind of ends. It's the end of the empire. And there's still people over there, but those people choose or you know, actively choose not to, or for whatever reason they choose not to belong to that empire, or that empire chooses not to have those people in it. Because before we had these set in stone boundaries, territory or, you know, borders was mostly defined by the people in it and who they chose to belong to. Like if you're on the edge of two frontiers, or two border, two borderlands, you could kind of play sides and as your, you know, whatever your community wanted to do, or you'd just be the subject of both being tried to be conquered. I mean, it's, it's not the best time to be a human. When is the best time to be a human? Probably right now, if I <laughs> guess. doesn't feel like it, but. A great example of kind of not really deciding, kind of playing both sides, is actually something that was developed in the Middle Evil Ages, Medieval Ages, but still exists today. Nick, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a town called Bayule, I know I mispronounced that. It's uh, located both in the Netherlands and Belgium. And Nick, I want to talk about like how, you know, usually when you talk about territory or border, there's a kind of like a defined line, at least some geometry to it. Not this town. Uh, random pockets are owned by bo either side of each country. Like the best way I could describe it audibly for the visual is imagine a cow with a black and white pattern and the black and white spots, those are what part of the town is owned by which country. It's a clusterfuck. But they came up with an idea in medieval ages and they kind of play both sides. So you're, it honestly might be you live in the Netherlands, your neighbor lives in the, in Belgium, your neighbor next to them lives in the Netherlands. It can, that can actually happen. Yeah, it's just that that's your, you know, sense of belonging you feel like you're part of them and until someone with the bigger army comes through you can do whatever you want <laughs> it's all it's all good until the horses come yeah and the thing about um like borderlands and and frontiers like that this these are the areas where you had criminals right where you could live outside of society so this is where you know travel became difficult because it was not part of anything so you, people could just do whatever out there there was no no patrols. Rome wasn't sending anyone out. Like, and that's what makes these areas a little bit more dangerous, and why people chose to come into these, you know, cities. Like, I want to get back to the uh, city of Ur, which again, 
I think is crazy. 4,500 years before Christ. Humanity is old. Civilization That's a long is time. old as well. Yeah. And like a city of 30,000 people. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I imagine Ur is in the cradle of life, so either Middle you East, North Africa. Guessed it. Right there in Mesopotamia. Right the right exactly where you think it is. But uh the first thing they did was built a wall. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they built a, a sandstone wall and we're so like I don't know how big it was, and I think we we don't really know how big it was, but we can excavate it today and figure out that it was in fact like a wall. So it's kind of interesting. And I think that just goes to show that, you know, we do kind of need borders. We do need kind of need to establish borders. And along the establishment of borders, there's three big changes that helped establish those. The first one is law. Now, law helps establish borders by, one, make creating rules for a society to follow, but two, treaties between, you know, between other tribes, other nations, whatever you want to call it. We need to have some kind of law, a, co- a society complex enough to create laws that we can not only create laws for ourselves, but others as well. Obviously, those laws are, you know, how many border disputes there are. Even today, those laws get broken all the time, but you need to start somewhere. Yeah, it's also, I, it, to me, a huge part of why borders developed as they were in ancient times or modern times all has to do with economics. Is as long as, long as the money is coming in, we can we can talk we can definitely go to the conversation table when money's not coming in that's when i see a lot of countries and empires expand their borders for more resources it's like they want more they're not getting as much as they want coming in and yeah i mean it's it's amazing how much a wall could do i just can't think help but think of the alamo of some wooden eight foot tall lip like twigs not i'm not even talking these aren't logs help hold off the Mexican, uh, then the Napoleon of the West from taking over the Alamo for a couple of days. Yeah, and that's like going back to the Hadrian Wall again. The Hadrian Wall is only like 12 feet tall. This isn't like some huge giant structure. It was, I mean, an impressive feat for the time, but it, uh, I guess do a little explanation. So the Hadrian Wall is it's 73 miles of wall that runs through England that I'm trying to... Remember the guy's name who built it? Hadrian. Oh, my God. I'm just going to shoot myself right now. <laughs> I thought that was a joke, but I guess it's not. Yeah. Sorry. Just too much going on. Um, but, yeah, so it was built to keep out enemies of Rome, and it was a big thing that Hadrian wanted to get done. It was kind of like his pet project. And uh, the interesting thing is we – it was in history historical times have been described as being 12 feet tall we think is about 15 feet tall but we don't know how much it costs to build because they don't keep records the way we would keep records of you know like a any government project you'd keep records and so we don't know if that means that they just went and took you know rock from whoever happened to own the land around it or they paid them for it or they just like gave money to someone to get it done or, or exactly how it got done but we don't know how much it costs to build but it was a manned wall. It had forts that people would be in every mile. It had like a place to for soldiers to kind of sit in. And the thing about this, and just like the Great Wall, it needs to be manned. And talking about these two, I wanted to talk about an idea that I heard, Mike, that I think is kind of stupid, but I, w- I want to bring it out because I want people to hear it and then kind of hear, talk through it of... and. A lot of times this is referenced to the U.S.-Mexico border, but I've also heard it referenced to Hadrian's Wall as well as the Great Wall of China of if you're powerful enough to, be, like, are these countries really powerful enough? You know, are they so powerful they can build these great walls but can't conquer their enemies? Does that mean they're really a powerful country? Uh, that's a stupid question. <laughs> right? I mean, to me, the first thing that pops in my head is, like, what are you supposed to, like, supposed to go Napoleon and just conquer everyone like it you can't i mean people have tried but you can't just conquer everyone like i don't know what what they're suggesting that it would have been better for china and rome to just kill everyone else i guess i'm confused i i I get the sentiment of what they're trying to say i don't agree with it but i understand where they're coming from but i just don't think it's a well thought out argument oh my first analogy was bring it closer to home 
your home has walls. Walls, in some way, is a fort. It's like a caveman cave. That's protection. Uh, are you saying you're not, a, if you're a weak person, if you live in a house? I wouldn't say that. And, I mean, you can only do so much. There's only so much manpower. If I can make a machine or a natural barrier to do it for me, I mean, that kind of seems like a win-win. I don't have to pay a wall a salary. I can pay a garrison to watch 10 miles, 50 miles, rather than have troops go through, march through, conquer, kill, the logistics alone. I'm saving money building a wall. Well, not even that. Just think about this, Mike. A rhino marks its territory, and someone goes, hey, rhino, you a bitch for marking your territory, and just gets fucked up by that rhino that's a <laughs> you would never do that you would never say that that rhino is being a bitch by marking its territory <laughs> yeah it uh, everything in nature is take what you can and give nothing back and that's uh from from the mighty rhino to the roman empire to modern day countries so yeah borders have been built for a long time a lot of countries utilize walls for their borders but you know a lot of times that there's just a defined border Like, the Rhine was one of the most defined borders of the Roman Empire. Rivers, mountains, I mean, (laughs) a lot of mountain ranges were just, that was it. You know, you look at geographic features, a lot of times they line up with those, like, look at um, Nepal. It's just (laughs) wherever the mountains are, that's where their their country ends. Yeah, I was thinking of Greece with their city-states. It's such a mountainous region that each city-state was kind of its own country just because it's mountains in the way it's hard for people that they have a geographical barrier in them i mean it's hard to climb mountains nowadays to climb mountains back then it's a true feat and how to move armies that's that's so hard i mean look at hannibal hannibal had to cross the alps to get to italy and he lost lots of his men he lost his eye i mean it, no no roman thought hannibal would be able to cross the alps in winter and yet he did it, it was a natural protection a natural barrier and sand tundras oceans rivers lakes i mean it's it's a really kind of easy line going okay so this bank is this river is mine the other side's yours that's real easy but rivers change nick rivers do change rivers do change and people get pissed when they change but we set our borders on them it's like what are we supposed to do and then that's where the fighting happens lots and lots of fighting I honestly would not want to be the person who has to count all the wars started over uh, over countries disputing on who owns what, let alone imagine how many people have homeowners slash like their own house problems that they have argued and disputed with their neighbors. Like it's millions upon millions at that point. From someone who works with property boundaries a lot, so I can't stress enough how many arguments there are not only on where is the property boundary but what can you do on your side of the property how is that going to affect me like property boundaries people get surveyed out there all the time they hire crooked surveyors to you know you can (laughs) if you pay enough or a little depending on who you find you can get a survey that says where your property is wherever the fuck you want it to be (laughs) so and, and this is a problem especially out west because back east things are pretty well defined i forget what year it is but we decided we were going to survey the entire united states turn it into the public land survey system and everything was going to be surveyed and what did we do we projected a two-dimensional map onto the world which spoiler alert world's not flat three-dimensional all our straight lines don't add up so now we have to kind of go back and auto correct our all our mistakes and by auto correct i mean people need to go out and take measurements and account for slope and all this stuff and and try and fix this broken system we have but when when we do that we might move someone's property line anywhere from a few centimeters to like you know three meters there you go mike threw in meters for you a few yards nine feet exactly i knew that um but yeah so and people get pissed i mean people go to court for moving your property line way less than that people care about property lines and that, and property lines don't even relegate a change in legal distinction. <laughs> like, it's not like if this property line changes three feet, you have to pay more taxes or less. I mean, it could be, but, or like you have to worship a different God. Like, that's not what this is. This is 
definitely not as life threatening as change in property or change in borders used to be in the past. Well, I say a perfect example of in the past that we're dealing with now is the U.S. Canada borderline. I think they drew it what on the twenty second or twenty fourth parallel, and because they used old techniques, the line's not straight. So the straight line on the parallel is all crooked and messed up in places. And now U.S. and Canada have disputes in both the maritime region and uh, the land region. And we're just still constantly arguing and bickering over it. Yep, I believe that. Well, if you look at, uh, we'll post this map that has a map of the world where every border has the date it was last changed. The border kind of by the southeast Alaska was changed in 1903, which is pretty recently compared to everything else is about 1840s, you know, 1818, 1783. For the U.S., I was going to say you should look at Mexico. I mean, uh, you should look at Africa. Yeah, no, that's for the New World. If you scroll over to Europe and Africa, it's a different ballgame there. Europe is the oldest. You got the border of France and Germany. I see 1713. There's older ones. There's some 1100s there. Can't remember where they're at exactly. Oh, Portugal and Spain, 1143, 1297. Hey, 1278. Uh, I mean, that's uh, that's when um, Aragon, Aragon became part of uh, Spain through, uh, through marriage. And that's where you kind of get Queen Elizabeth I, the one who started the, 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 uh, the Spanish Inquisition. So, lovely. Perfect. Perfect. Uh... No one expects it. No one expects the, the Spanish, Spanish Inquisition. Inquisition. That's how I, that, I mean, I wasn't even expecting to fit it into this episode. So another thing that really helped us establish borders was maps. It's hard to establish borders without maps. You can do it word of mouth, you know, a small area, a town, a village, our territory extends here. Cool. But once you start getting a little bit bigger, you kind of need maps so you can see see where everything's at and the maps not only help define your quote-unquote borders, because your borders are only as good as the people around you also believe in them. Even with the <laughs> people were talking about some of the most effective border walls in history, and a lot of people brought up Hadrian's Wall, and someone was like, it's bold of all these people to say Hadrian's Wall is such a good wall when Rome was sacked twice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. They were never sacked by the Brits. Does that does that matter? That It's true. Um but so maps are, I think they're more more helped establish larger societies where you can help allocate resources better, create a bigger empire than anything, but obviously a, a huge leap forward in the quote-unquote technology of, of borders. Maps got further helped, Mike, by another throwback, Harrison's clock that helped establish Latin long. Helps to know where on the world you are. <laughs> yeah, now that we figured out how we can measure things on a fixed space and not just in relation to something else. Now we can create precise maps, not just maps, precise maps. I mean, we've all seen a world, a world map from like when we were exploring America that didn't have America where you just go from Europe to Asia. I, I, I don't think people realize how hard map making is. It's not, you don't get satellites, you don't get pictures, you get, some you get kind of whatever equipment you make and you kind of just draw the border trying to do uh, to find the long i mean a huge part of our mapping of the ocean was simply dropping a heavy wake a heavy weight with tied knots to represent a, a distance on the rope and you gotta imagine that was the most advanced way to measure the seafloor what was the most advanced way to measure the coastline of a country now imagine once you get in like I imagine everyone at one point in their life has been lost a little bit. Like, huh, where am I? And they look for whatever street name they are, whatever the sun's heading, trying to back travel a little bit, try to figure out their orientation. Now imagine doing that for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles. Well, someone's trying to kill you because you're on, <laughs> not, you're, you crossed out of your, your borderland, your, your nation. You don't even have to worry about that. First, you got to figure out which is clean water, what is food. Hell, if a bad storm comes in, all of a sudden things change. If a flood happens, that's going to change the geography. Oh, this is a swampland. Well, you came during the wet time. So during the dry season, it's not a swampland. So now it's a completely different thing on the map. Yeah. So 
yeah, I can't stress enough how crazy the map making was. And it's easy for us to sit back and laugh at how bad these maps were. When in reality, they were taking in what they thought was good data, doing their best to come up with a map of the world without ever seeing the whole world, just taking how far is this point from the sun, like how far is this point from something else, taking your knowns and guessing your unknowns. We sail for 10 hours on good wind south until we hit this land. Well, what's good wind? What is south true south? Like it's it's amazing what they were able to do. Like we, we might... don't have magnetic north. There was no declination. No one knew to change their compasses a certain degree when you hit a certain area to account for the magnetic deviation from true north of the earth. That's not something that happened automatically, which it is kind of now. We take it for granted. Like I, it's to me the old map makers fascinating lives fascinating job and i don't know how they even like did it like i I, how hard it had to be yeah it's hard as a for us to talk shit when i I saw a statistic like 90 percent of people can't point out which way is north no well why would you have google maps for everything but it was also in a book explaining fucking east and sets in the west you have to it was trying is the book was about how people have lost their way with navigating so i feel like some liberties may have been taken but uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but I also feel like it's under that. But uh, One can hope it's under that. So I kind of wanted to, you know, people, well, let's talk about borders. Let's talk about crossing borders. So in the for the longest time, there weren't, you know, crossing borders today. What does that think of? You got, got to get your passport, you know, not state borders. We're talking about international nation borders you got a passport you got to have your paperwork you can't have committed crimes all this shit you know back in like the 15th century when everyone was you know people traveled to jerusalem for pilgrimage journeys and they had to travel through many countries feudal systems like all this stuff so what did they need to bring well one they brought clothes that denoted them as pilgrims and that basically got them through a lot of stuff because pilgrims are generally poor. So all the uh, along the ra- along the way, so you're coming from Europe, you have to cross through all the different you know roads, and you have to pay a tax in certain areas. Just like you know, just like you're driving in Illinois, you got ta- toll after toll after toll. So places built roads, and you'd have to pay a toll to use those roads because. There was no state. There was, you know, you had... Which is utter fascinating to me, because if I saw a toll coming up, and I, it was medieval times where people making the pilgrims, I would just simply walk into the woods maybe three miles and then and then try to cross. I feel like there's probably some enforcement, although I will not... I researched this and didn't even, like, look that up of how to get around medieval tolls. But uh, there is no... There was no Apple None like shall that without pass. tolls. Second Monty Python reference. We are doing hitting Fire everything today. All cylinders. I like it. See, just starting with shots is how we is how we should start every episode. It's a good point. Good point noted. So these pilgrims would go and they'd have to pay these tolls. And some places, you know, your roads shit. Some places have a, a really good road. Now, like there's stories of people blasting through a hillside so that they could make a nice road and people would gladly pay that toll instead of going all the way around. Some places didn't charge pilgrims for tolls because, well, they have no money. They're making more money just, you know, taxing the businesses that come through. You know, someone's got, you know, some commodity. They got wood, they got grain, whatever. They're just going to tax them. It's easier. You just tax the wagons. Don't worry about the people. You know, some people have said, well, isn't that a good way to smuggle stuff? Just dress as a pilgrim and carry it? It's like, yeah, but it's not like they had cocaine. I mean, there's not much stuff that you could put in small amounts and get across, I feel like, compared to now. And also, these are just, you know, feudal systems, kings, queens. Like, it's not the state, like the United States. It's not like we have, T- like, TSA agents, Border Patrol agents, all these people checking for you bringing, you know, spices across the border it's probably a few dudes out there just trying to get a paycheck. So it wasn't this, you know, had to bring paperwork kind of thing. 
a lot of times when pilgrims were leaving, they would bring a note from their, for lack of a better word, Lord, and saying like, I'm, you know, Lord Farquaad of so-and-so. <laughs> and, <laughs> I want, <laughs> give me back my swamp. And, and these people are seeking uh, pil- like pilgrimage rites or whatever to X place. They'd send them with letters, but that only gets you out of so much. And especially if, like, if you're a European nation or you lived in Europe and then you're traveling to the Middle East, once you get to the Middle East, that note doesn't mean anything. I mean, those people, they have no idea who that is. Like, what what's that supposed to get you? Not to mention if it's even in the same language that they can understand. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, it's a... Yep. I'm just trying to think. If you're traveling from France to, say, Jerusalem, going through at least Italy... You're going through probably Constantinople. Those two alone, uh, if that's that's if by going by ship. I don't know if you're going by land, what countries you would pass. But those two countries alone, very different languages. I- Italian and what, I don't know what the language of insensible is, but uh, since it's this time, I assume some of the population speaks Arabic. Arabic and Italian, very different. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's another great point of, like I said about, uh, borders at the time, you had defined borders, but a lot of times the border was the community. People identified their own borders, and one of those ways was language. If you, if you didn't treat your, if you didn't speak that language, you're no longer in your area. So, there's there's one good way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, I imagine also a wall, not just for defensive region. I'm also thinking it's a great way to filter through people. I'm thinking. Of the example of, like I said, with Constantinople, I mean, they only have a certain amount of ports, so all the rest are walled off. So you can kind of control the flow of people entering and leaving your kingdom. And I would not count that as uh, being weak, Nick, as that one analogy you had earlier on. Yeah, no, it's, uh, no, that's not, I don't think there's any part of that that's presenting weakness. So you get all the way down there, and uh, and there's bad things that happen on the way, right? You know, you might pay a toll. Well, guess what? It's just like Blazing Saddles. Just some guy set up a toll booth. That's not the real toll. You got to pay every toll you come across. So now you got to pay the actual toll. Someone just swindled you out. Once you get down to wherever you're, you get down to your Middle Eastern country, you don't speak the language. So you're going to get a quote unquote guide. You might get an actual guide who can translate and show you what you want to see, or you're just getting someone who's extorting you for money. So you don't know. There's no Google Translate, like, completely on your own. I just thought that that, uh, there, there, you know, also all these roads, the, why did people pay these tolls, Mike? One of the reasons is, uh, I'm just putting this together now. So the border, any area not patrolled, a lot of these roads, these bigger roads, people stayed on them because they were safer. You're more likely to have guards. There's no one picking you off. When you get off those main roads, that's you're in the frontier. You you don't really have the rule of law. So I think it's that it's safer to just stay on the roads and pay the toll than it is to someone to just take all your stuff. I also think it's both ignorance and easier. It's just easier to walk a somewhat trail or paved road versus to hike it through con- uh, the country. And also it's like, oh, you know, I just got to pay my way. That's if you didn't, if you weren't educated and you didn't know any better, it's like, oh yeah, life's always sucked. So paying a couple coins so I can go through here, just kind of how it's always been. Yeah. So I thought it was interesting. I mean, it was also crazy. You know, we talk about, or not talk about, but you, you hear people do a r- religious pilgrimage now where you fly to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> These guys walked from Europe down there's no there's no translation books much less an app yeah literally richard the lionheart went all the way to jerusalem just to fight salahadin that's from england to jerusalem that's the different tropical regions alone is amazing the different languages near uncountable it's that's just amazing like the logistics of moving that far not just like with an army, but just by yourself, how hard that is to do. Hell, Nick, we've all known people that if we go on a camping trip, or they'll forget something. If you forget something and you're three thousand miles into your journey, you're fucked. Yeah, you gotta you gotta buy it somewhere else, and you're gonna pay an arm and a leg probably. Yeah, that's ins- it's it's insane. I did see something that I I didn't confirm, but I want to throw it out there. 
see what you thought. I don't think it's super believable, but I, I did hear some people started doing some of the crusades in order to help their pilgrims because they were just getting fucked up when they got down there in the Middle East. I mean, that's how the Knights Templars formed was they were supposed to be knights to guard the pilgrims going to the Jerusalem. Hmm. I thought it was over something else. No, they eventually became very rich and powerful, and they just kind of go, oh, well, okay, we'll do this. But they, I think <laughs> their initial was where they were French knights to uh, to safeguard the pilgrims and protect the roads. So there, <laughs> there you go. I was not right. Anyway, keep going. So that's kind of pretty much all I have on 15th century pilgrimages. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to fast forward to, and also Dark Ages, which we were talking about how it hard it is to make maps. Well, it wasn't just the coastlines they were making. They're making maps of inland, too. And I don't know if this is too far forward in your timeline, but I'd like to bring up the Berlin Conference that happened in 1884 through 1885, where Europeans sat around a table and divided up Africa. I'm good with that. The only th- I just want to throw an honorable mention because we talked about... Uruk and Ur and the Hadrian Wall. We can't do this podcast without mentioning the Great Wall of China, which is probably the biggest and most well-known border wall of pretty much, I mean, anything, any of them. So that's all. I don't don't really have any interesting about it, but I feel like we should mention it as it's pretty big. And People like it. Built on skulls and dead bodies and slave labor and all that fun stuff. Well, speaking of slave labor, colonization in Africa. So as the 1800s rolled around, that segue though. Oh yeah, I, I got Nick. We just need to we just need to drink some shots before this, and we're firing on cylinders. And uh, before the invention of the car with all cylinders, a lot of the traveling was done by camel, horseback, and on foot. So they had guides. Some calli- uh, what was it called? Map makers. It's not calligraphy. Calligraphy is the writing, but something was cartographers. This. Cartographers. Thank you. They had cartographers walk around. And try to figure out. And a prime, a British prime minister by the name of Lord Salisbury in 1906, I think had a great quote about dividing up Africa. Makes good stakes. And I appreciate the pun, Nick. You, you tried. Here, there's a gold star in there at the end for you. But again, most Europeans, most map mapping this time, still kind of shitty. But Lord Salisbury said... We have been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's feet ever tread, ever trod. We have ever been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impedience that we never knew exactly where the mountains, rivers, and lakes were. End quote. And uh, yeah, he was specifically talking about England and France dividing up territories in Africa, but I think it's quite fitting for all of Africa of the colonization. They are d- literally dividing up lots of territory. If I remember correctly, there was a either Portugal or Spain lord who wanted more territory to hunt. So they just gave him a swamp land towards the end of his territory. And that's why this one country has like a peninsula in the middle of its uh, territory. Hmm. It it's, it's just weird on how, how, willy-nilly the borders were drawn which comes to my next fact now this might be getting a little too modern and feel free to pull me back but i read an interesting study called the long run effects of for of the scramble for africa by stelios michael and elias Papanunun. that's best as i can do folks um but in their paper they researched and discussed long-term effects of the continent being divided by colonialism the same cultures being forced into non-natural borders and how that might have caused recent conflicts and how that many rebel groups and civil wars and wars in Africa stem from colonialism colonialism map making. So like Nick and I were discussing in the beginning of the podcast where there were just kind of natural borders. You know, if you all spoke the same language, you kind of stayed all together. It's kind of that kind of territory. If you all pay taxes to the same person, yeah, you're all part of this territory. Well, it's the same with ethnic beliefs. So if you have a certain religion, a certain kind of try, a certain custom, and all of a sudden some people just draw a line in between saying this is now Ethiopia, this is now Nigeria, you have no say in it, that's going to cause conflict. 
And I think there's actually some merit to their truth. Now, in the study, which our sources are on YouTube, so you can always check out, they did say take it with an asterisk because they only did 20 different countries and 8,600 people, which uh, to me, anyone who starts off with take this with an asterisk, I'm already uh, liking you because uh, that means you're quite reasonable. But it's uh, it's quite interesting because, again, stick with the kind of modern, but Nigeria and Cameroon settled a border dispute in international court by using Germany and British colonial maps when they, when they were colonizing Africa. So that's the reason why those countries still have those borders as they are, is simply because some map maker, before the invention of the internet, before mass use of electricity, decided what the borders were and just the countries were forced to it, which is kind of, this is kind of theoretical, but I think it's a good point because we're talking about old and new. The question arises, do borders that were made when a country was controlled by foreigners, do those borders still stand? So if I'm a, a crusader, uh, king, I'll just stick with uh, Richard Lionheart. If I'm a Richard Lionheart crusading into Holy Land and I mic up new maps and territories. Do those maps and territories still dictate in the 21st century of our borders? Same with colonialism within Africa, which are much closer. If a Belgium country decides the border of an African nation, do those African nations have to decide that that's the border they want? Is that the border they have to use? Or can they revert to an older border or a heritage border is sometimes called where it's heritage borders, heritage borders like Hadrian's Wall or um, or your customs. It's like an older artifact or an older way that still exists, but not completely defined or in law. That's kind of what a heritage border is. So that's my question to you, Nick. And I have a response you're going to hate. I think it depends on two things, geographic determinism and cultural determinism. Is there a geographic boundary that there that separates the two or is there a cultural boundary there that is, are they separate otherwise I, I feel like they'll just form back together well i have a i have a perfect example for one for that for you this granted like you said it's it is a bit of case type case scenario but i think this is a good example it didn't start peacefully but it kind of ended peacefully the haleb triangle or the halib triangle is an area located between egypt and sudan the initial border set in 1899 along the 22nd parallel, it was made by the British to divide the two countries. After decades of fighting in 1998, the two countries decided to go to the discussion table and in 2000, Sudan seceded control of this region to Egypt. But, that this is a caveat that I'll bring back later on in the podcast, Sudanese rebels keep claiming that the land is Sudan's and keep fighting for it, but that border of Egypt and Sudan was made by the British during colonial times. Is that still standable? It's a pretty much straight line. There's no there's no cultural differences really, and there's no uh, physical mountains or rivers or anything like that. It is pretty much they just use the twenty second parallel. I mean, not, <laughs> I don't know. It feels like that's that's something they need to figure out. I, I don't I I don't think I have know enough about the culture to to figure that out now. If and I guess the question is, how does that affect them? Does having those be separate countries, does that limit them on trade? On, or does it give more freedoms? Is one country just a shithole and the other country's awesome? Like, I, I just don't know. Well, I'm just saying that's a good example of maps drawn by your conquerors, not drawn by yourself. Like, imagine if America never rearranges borders after defeating the British. We, as Americans, have to kind of decide our borders. Granted, we conquered and took some of our borders, but we had say in our borders. Some countries in Africa had no say in their borders. They were just in Asia, just due to colonialism. And does that, do those lines in the sand that were theoretically drawn on a map by peop, by a lot of people who were never even in that country or part of that heritage or culture have the right to say where a border is or not a border? Well, I think that, is bringing it down to the question of what is a border. And it sounds like that's not a real border in the sense of it's not a division. There's there's no division between separate cultures. There's no geographic boundary. It's just an imaginary line that we decided to draw. Now, and then I think what would make that a border or not is if the people around it decide to follow it. If it starts creating a division, 
or it separates two people, if it separates their cultures in a way that they become separate, then yeah, I I would say that that's a, a border. But if they decide to just not use it, I mean, it's it's all in our heads until it's not. If they're if they're going off it and saying that's somebody else, then pretty soon they'll be somebody else. So I, I think it really depends on how the people on the ground are reacting to that border. Does now I guess your question is does should we draw borders like that? Probably not. I mean that's we don't draw any other borders just like willy nilly like that. I feel like there's more thought to it, but it's the that's the, the time it was. Well, unfortunately there's still a lot standing with that. I'll I'll get to that in a second. But you're more talking about like consequent border. Consequent bordery? Borders? Not quite sure. They're borders that are made up by separate religious, ethic, or economic groups. So the best examples I could come up with in my head is modern South Africa, uh, the Berlin Wall, or um, Israel and Palestine, which is, Nick, I don't know if you did borders on Israel and Palestine. I just was looking at it, and I said, nope, not today. I also said, nope, not today. Okay, okay. But so yeah, this, I, if you haven't figured it out right now, we're not really discussing any like hot button topic issues. Because they're complicated and people feel strongly about them and they're just, it's a big grenade and we're not ready to pull the pin just yet. Uh, It's fine. I have enough uh, whiskey. Let's talk about India and Pakistan for a minute, uh, Nick. Okay, we are pulling the pin. (laughs) I'm still, I'm still holding the spoon, so we're fine. So. India and Pak I just wanted to do this now because you said that. Uh India and Pakistan have been fighting over an area called Kashmir, I think is how you pronounce it. It there have been three wars fought over this land. And for, I did not realize on how important geography is to India. I'm not talking on a physical sense, I'm talking on an emotional and ethics stance. There was an Indian bill proposed that it would be illegal to sell or give false tropical tropographical information. The bill did not pass, but the idea that even made to their parliament is quite impressive. But the reason why I bring up this Kashmir region is because of Google fucking Maps. Google Maps has a different map for this area and different for other areas. Just depends on where you open Google Maps. If you open Google Maps in India, it shows a very hard borderline in India's favor. If you open Google Maps in Pakistan, it will show you a completely different border setup. See, and I'm that's playing a- both sides, so I always come out on top. For fucking real. And it's the same. It's not the only country that does that for it. Depending on your IP, China. China is a... Shocker. <laughs> China, boy, there's not enough whiskey in the world to talk about china's geography conundrums is a polite way to say it let's just start uh, I, all right i'm going off the rails uh china is a clusterfuck in the south china sea i'm uh, talking about just the south china sea now the south china sea is not owned by china it's just named the sea like the indian ocean it's just named the indian ocean the south china sea they have pushed their maritime borders very very far now, most maritime borders, I think, are like four or six miles. China went, fuck that. We want it all. So much for, so much that Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan, and Vietnam have all issues with China trying to take more of their water territory. China's on a conquest, and boy, are they winning. And I don't, I'll personally don't want to get into how many land border disputes China has. I'm going to tell you it's more than their water disputes. And Nick, I don't know if you know this, but um, other country, I I don't understand other countries on how they affiliate borders within their country. Is that, uh, all right. An example, America, we have the states. We have certain regions, most of them are natural boundaries, or they're boundaries by law, or they're boundaries by parallels. So we have 50 states, one special district, which is Washington, D.C., which is our capital. I think we're all on the same page here. China, inside China, there are 22 provinces, five autonomous regions, three independent municipals, and a special administrative region. And for those who don't know, an autonomous region is an area which conduct its own government but not an independent country so uh think hong kong 
And special administrative reading is kind of like Washington, D.C. we have here in the States, but it's um, it's a little different than that, but pretty much the same, same, same kind of thing. But, I, damn it. I was going to ask you a question, but I don't want to pick solely on China, so because China's not the only one with the clusterfuck. India has 25 states, 7 union territories. Vietnam has 50 provinces and, tw- and 2 special regions. It's weird it has 50 provinces. Vietnam is not exactly the biggest country. Indonesia has 24 provinces and 2 special regions, which, depending on what country you're from, their islands are disputed. Uh, Indonesia also has a special capital city district. Japan, I did not realize, still has 47 prefectures. Now, prefectures is an administrative jurisdiction traditionally governed by an appointed perfect. A perfect, coming from the uh, prefeci, which is Latin to put in front of, is a magistrate position which depends on the government. So I guess Japan is divided into 47 territories, all kind of governing themselves, kind of like states. But it's weird to me how small Japan is, and that's a thing. Well, it's hard It's it's hard to talk shit because the state of Idaho has less counties than like pretty much any eastern state. Well, the population's far different. Idaho County in Idaho is bigger than the state of Rhode Island, <laughs> and it's one county. So I feel like it's hard to talk shit. Oh, this is a caveat we never talked about, but how borders are sometimes just made because land is gifted to people. I mean, I'm thinking now of Maryland. Maryland is really just named after a guy that the king of England said, eh, you've been loyal. Here's some land in the new in the new world. But I do, I do want to mention Russia because that's another clusterfuck. I don't know what these are. I kind of gave up after how complex it got. Russia has 49 obelisks, 21 autonomous republics, 10 autonomous okrugs, 6 kreas, 2 federal cities, 1 autonomous obelisk, and this is all before Ukraine. I have no idea what's going to happen now. Yeah, I feel like it doesn't count if it's a communist country. Eh, I put Russia more under dictatorship. Dictatorship, capitalist dictatorship, whatever you want to call it. Does it really matter? No, it really, really kind of doesn't. But I think another important thing is going back to the culture region and uh, and just language is empires of the old got too big where it was unsustainable. It's it, it was easy to break up countries and split them once empires fell into smaller and easier territories to rule, simple cultures. Like, um, it's a ama- it, it, for those in the states or in Europe or South America or actually anywhere you're listening to this, if you travel 50 miles in any direction, you're gonna get some different people than what you're accustomed to. Like if I if I'm in if I'm in Dallas and I travel I don't know three hours south to Austin, I'm gonna get a lot more weirder people in Austin than in Dallas, which is you know they would probably say the same about me, but it's different regions, just in cultures. Sometimes there's a natural split. And sometimes, rather than just territories, countries agree to split up. In 1989, the Velvet Revolution brought the country to a divorce. Now, granted, they were fighting, but they eventually came to an agreement. A peaceful, a relative peaceful agreement, I think is an important asterisk there. And that's how you got the Czech Republic in in Slovakia. They decided no more. Let's just split into two different countries. Could you imagine, Nick, the audacity, the balls to split into, to to give up territory to split into another country? I hope the peace talks went a lot like, it's not you, it's me. (laughs) Damn, Nick, you got the jokes today. Another quote-unquote peace talk happened in uh, 2014. After 20 years, Indonesia and the Philippines settled a maritime agreement. And I thought this was a great way to handle the border dispute. They made an agreement that overlapping zones for high and economic zones are to be shared. So as long as that money keeps going in for both of us, kuda matata, no, we don't have to fight about it. As long as everyone gets a piece of the pie, we're all good. Well, and that's, that's what it's all about, getting a piece of that pie. I mean, we even do that here in the States. I did not know this, Nick, but uh, do you know you know Liberty Island, right? The island that holds the Statue of Liberty? And that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge on Liberty Island, but go on. Do you know who owns 
the Statue of Liberty's island? France? I don't know. Well, it's not New York. You know who owns it? It's fucking New Jersey. New Jersey owns the Statue of Liberty's island. But they made an agreement with New York that New York can have control, but the taxes go to New Jersey as long as New Jersey supplies this electricity to the island. <laughs> Again, as long as the money keeps going in, everyone's happy. And I, I think it's kind of important to note that uh, kind of what I was kind of leading to that you missed so is... when people are like, how do we tear down these borders? It's it's literally just money. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But I was gonna try to make a New Jersey joke there, but uh, yeah, we'll I go mean, on. We'll we'll wait. Uh, so I mean, imagine going to Ellis Island. You're traveling across the Atlantic Ocean to new land, new opportunity, and you see the Statue of Liberty. Well, you're not going to New York. You're going to Jersey, and you get to see all those Jersey Shore people meet you. It was something on that. It was a lot funnier in my head, but saying it out loud, it's a lot less funny. That's a good introduction to the United States, though. Like, oh, man, this is going to be awesome. Then you just meet a bunch of people from New Jersey. Boy, that's disappointing. But like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, America and Canada, tons of disputes, especially land, because the parallel we made isn't straight. But water is the more important one, in my opinion. Water means trade. Like you said, Nick, as long as the money's coming in, we're all good. Everyone likes the everyone likes gold. Everyone likes green. As long as that money's coming in. But that's how some of the biggest disputes get in. I mean... We did one on the most peaceful war, a mini episode, which you check out Backyard Philosophy, about Canada and Denmark control of an island that they, how they do wars, they change the flag and leave a bottle of snops or whiskey. And the honey war. Oh, well, the honey war got a little bit more violent. Than, okay. What than about the, the uh, well, Midwestern states where they arrested the sheriff? It's not our first border dispute. It's not our first border dispute. That was between Iowa and Missouri. Um, but I mean, the whole reason why Illinois, I'm specifically Chicago has is Chicago is in Illinois is because Illinois needed a port to the great lakes. Chicago for the most part was going to be in Wisconsin, which is really weird to think about. But the reason why I keep bringing up all these little points of New Jersey, Canada, there would be no good rivalries. It's the Wisconsin bears versus the Wisconsin Packers. It doesn't even make sense. It'd be, I imagine, more like the Dallas Cowboys versus the Houston Texans. One being the AFC, one being the NFC. Anyhow. It's not the same. Yeah, it's not definitely not the same. Um, the reason why I bring up all these little disputes, especially Africa, coming back to Africa, wars over time since the 1949 or 47, I can't remember the date, have decreased. But civil slash state violence, though decreased in numbers, has increased in percentages. So what that means is, say the total number of violence was 25%. Over 50 years, it dropped down to 10%. From the initial 25%, let's say 20% was country to country and 5% 5% was internal beef. As time's gone on, that percentage dropped down to 10%. But the war from country to country is now down to 2% and the civil war is now 8%. So though the pie got smaller, the percentage of the pie that has fought inland, inwardly, has increased. And I think that's why I bring back this study I was talking about earlier about how colonialism has affected the war slash the border disputes in Africa. Africa, for relative speaking, is a vertical continent. It's not horizontal like uh, Asia, Europe, or America, the America, North America, I should say specifically. Africa is more lengthways that is divided in more different regions, different cultures. So it's harder for cultures to spread more naturally that's why a big component of why um africa didn't develop as quickly as a large scale as europe and asia is simply because they had no large animals for production because all the animals were scared of the humans because they grew up with humans compared to like a dumb bull in europe or asia but also tropographical regions now when you add that civil wars have increased over time sorry so wars have the percentages increased over time, though the amount have decreased, might be due to colonialism, maybe due to borders. Like I mentioned with the Sudan, Sudanese rebels keep trying to fight for the Halabib Triangle, which is mineral rich. But if I'm looking at, you know, the Congo, the DCNR, the South Africa, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, the West Coast, the Gold Coast, the Slave Coast, I'm looking at all these coasts. 
all these territories, all these regions, they tend to be a lot of rebel groups fighting inside of them, trying to clean, quote unquote, ethnically, so a lot of genocides. But that might be due to borders being split so they weren't with their, quote unquote, people. So, eth uh, so again, colonizers just splitting a tribe or a group in half, one's north, one's south, trying to renew. Uh, renew. That's a, uh, it's not really a straight line functionality but to me it kind of makes sense nick when i was reading this research of more civil wars happen in the african region because geographically they were split up by borders not made naturally by them but by foreigners and i was wondering to get your opinion on this that's an interesting thought i definitely never thought of it that way but i mean it does check out right there's more i don't know what you call civil wars but internal conflicts like you said in that region I mean, that's, uh, it, I would be curious, not that we'll ever know, like, what it would be like to let everyone draw their own borders and see how that works out. But that's, uh, that's definitely something I never thought about. Well, one example I'm initially thinking of is the Rwanda massacre, which between the two religious groups that I can't quite remember, the Suez and, uh, I can't quite remember them. But I imagine, because, like, there's warlords forming right now. I imagine if they were able to separate their cultures to a different geography of, hey, my tribe over here, your tribe over there, I imagine there'd be a lot less conflict rather than people living on top of each other. I mean, look at South Africa. South Africa is a perfect example. South Africa, due to the apartheid in the past years, has shown violence, I guess is the best way to say it. Going all the way back to the Boer War to modern day where white farmers are getting executed, it's kind of gone down to their ethnic backgrounds where whites live somewhere else, the blacks live somewhere else, apartheid. That being said, the sins of the father, not the sins of the son. I don't support the people of South Africa murdering the farmers just because the farmer's great-great-grandfather took that land. I don't, I don't condone that violence, but it's a perfect example of... I mean, a lot of if you look at Cape Town specifically, there's a large district of blacks, a large district of whites. They're separated. Well, that's got to create conflict. I imagine that's like a Sparta in Athens. It's my tribe versus your tribe. I see the enemy. It and that's how it naturally kind of formed. Whether it was a good natural formation or a bad natural formation due to economics is a whole other discussion. But if you just let people kind of figure out their cliques, their tribes, their territories. It's a lot different than the forced territories upon it by a government or a foreign entity. That's definitely for sure. I mean, I don't really have anything to add. I think it's definitely, it's a, uh, there's a, there's a book called Prisoners of Geography that kind of talks not only a little bit about how, you know, borders and nations and problems are derided from just the availability of resources, the geography of the area. And I think there's something to be said for, you know, drawing borders like that where, you know, you, you can infer the, the outcome just based on when you look at, you know, the different, like, culture one, culture two, whoever it is, like, you're going to have problems or it's not going to, they're not going to work together. Well, I think a great example of that is the Sahara Desert. Uh, there are nomadic tribes that cross the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert is made up of multiple countries. I mean, what, you have Libya. I, 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 I imagine you have all the way from Morocco to Egypt. Well, those nomads, they don't care they don't follow any of those countries laws the sahara is just kind of their culture that's a way different region than how the sahara is divvied up on a map or at least to the world it's divvied up those those nomadics they just cross from border to border they do not care who owns or quote unquote owns the sahara desert it's just they just they just transverse they just go yeah i feel like that's more similar to how borders were in the in the past you don't need a passport. You just cross the border. Like when people say oh, a border is just a line we draw, it is. When it's like that, it isn't. <laughs> when someone's at the that line with a gun, right? And so, you know, anyone can cross the the border of Libya and Algeria in the Sahara Desert, and I don't think I'm guessing no one's going to stop you. And so you're right in that aspect. The borders are a, a lot more similar to borders of the past, where it's more of a frontier, a borderland of this area. It could be Algeria, it could be Libya. It 
it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change you know, your life that much, whatever one it is. Well, just kind of tied to the beginning of the podcast, I imagine those nomads traveling to the Sahara Desert are much like a snow leopard. They have no idea of the foreigners or the people they don't interact with drawing up lines. It was just their culture, their heritage, their region that naturally formed their borders. And it's it has nothing to do with outside influence, just internal. But you know what does have to do with internal and external, Nick? Climate change. And boy, is climate change fucking up borders. The sea level alone, just making it a... Uh, it just hurts my brain thinking about how much is changing. I want to start with start with the Mississippi River, which I found hilarious. Is it's a dark hilarious again? Keep that an asterisk. Is Louisiana is losing hecka acre thousands of hecka acres of land because the Mississippi is shifting. So Louisiana already won. I think the poorest state in the United States is losing even more land, and boy, they they can't win. Yeah, I mean that's that's classic Louisiana right there. Yeah, but it, I mean, water, land is at war. More land is being eroded away. Lot, rivers are being flooded, changed. So it begs the question, Nick, uh, before I get into the tangent of uh, climate change, will coastal territories remain the same even when the land has been eroded or moved inland? Now to describe this, so say we have California, we have the coastline of California. We'll say the maritime territory of the United States is four miles off the coast of California. So I looked this up because I thought it was 14. It's actually 12 maritime miles off the coast. Okay, 12. So say 12 lines, 12 miles off the boundary of the physical land of California. Now let's say sea level rises and we lose three miles inland of California. Do those 12 miles only count to the physical land of California or where the physical land used to be? I mean, you're asking a question as old as time. When a river reroutes, is the property boundary where the river used to be or where it is now? And the answer is probably the same as it's always been. Whoever has the biggest military decides where the boundary is. I just, I think that's how we solve border problems. That's how we've solved them in the past, and I don't think that's how we're going to stop solving them in the future. Well, I'm happy you brought up border problems, and I'm, hope, and I'm happy you brought up river, because I was going to talk about the Rio Grande, because that, too, is a clusterfuck. For those who don't know, Rio Grande is the river that separates the United States from Mexico, and due to climate change and just time itself just naturally changing the river, the river has moved, so to speak, so it begs the question... Do we still honor the first border drawn lines or the newer border drawn lines? I mean, we're going to negotiate for whichever is better, but I feel like there should be some sort of a, I mean, the way we're going to do it, we're going to renegotiate all of it, right? Like if we're going to look at the climate change aspect, we're going to talk about how we, uh, the, what is it? it's not the Colorado, the Colorado doesn't go through Mexico. What's the one that ends in Mexico? We have a river that flows from a few different states down to Mexico. And we had a treaty with Mexico that said, we looked at the past 15 years of flow data and said, no matter what, we'll always flow you this much water. Well, it turns out the last 15 years before that was an exceptional flood years. And so now, even in drought years, we have to flow them the amount of flood year water per our agreement. It's like there needs to be, if we're going to, you know, go through and redefine everything, we should be like, all right, we have a lot more data than we did back then. Let's sit down. Let's look at all these maps, all these treaties. We'll come up with some new numbers. And I think we'll have to play with that, right? Be like, hey, maybe we don't give you as much water because we gave you way more than you're supposed to be getting if you look at the actual flow of the river through years. But in exchange, you get to keep some of this border. Now, you know, if you're just doing the border, you can split it 50-50, call it a day. But that doesn't take into account, you know, how much money is tied up there. I mean, let's be honest. If we're going to get in a disagreement and there's a bunch of money there that the United States wants, we're just going to pay them whatever we want to get that is how I think that's going. I don't know if that's how that's going. Uh, one, it, you are correct. It was the Colorado River. Secondly, I don't think with land, like you said, Nick, in previous podcasts, land is one of those things that's really hard to make more of. So there's not it's slowly disappearing. 
I think everyone just wants more land because everyone knows how valuable land is. And I don't imagine in a border dispute, anyone wants to give up. Like at the ones I talked about peaceably, well, quote unquote peaceably, with Sudan and Egypt and uh, Slovakia and uh, the Czech Republic, that surprised the hell out of me. Or the Nigeria and something moon. I can't remember their name off the top of my head. Uh, where they just went to court for it. That's amazing to me. How we went from bashing each other over the head to take more land to we'll go to court. That's that's impressive to me. But I no one wants to give up more land. Well, one, that's not true. People will do it for money. So, I mean, a tale as old as time out west is people selling a bunch of land to get subdivided up into subdivisions. And everyone's sad about, oh... That used to be pasture or whatever, and now it's a subdivision. Well, guess what? Someone sold a bunch of land that they're never getting back for what? Boatloads of cash. So there are re- things people will sacrifice for boatloads of cash, land being one of them. Okay. Well, let me let me know, ask you another hypothetical. We were talking about climate change, how it shifts borders, rivers specifically. What if you had a restaurant, Nick, that opened in Italy, but due to climate change, the glacier it was sitting on in the Alps shifted and moved and now is technically in Switzerland. Is that an Italian restaurant or a Swiss restaurant? Uh, I feel like that needs to be sorted out by those countries. It'd probably still be an Italian restaurant, but I guess if it moved enough and the Swiss had a good claim to it and, and they really wanted the tax dollars from it, they probably would have a good legal case that it's theirs now. Well, uh, to me, it's So very- does that make it a legal immigration? I don't know. <laughs> Do, if you can survive father time it's legal uh it's legal migration uh but no it's interesting uh, just climate climate change is changing the borders it's moving quite literally mountains rivers and oceans it's changing our geography of the past and i'm just trying to figure out how we're keep keeping up with it like for example but th- this has always been an, a constant the nature's changing is a constant that we've dealt with through the history of time border like even like we're look at like the rhine which is one of rome's biggest borders that has changed over time and they've just dealt with it it's uh but humans and culture have never been at this scale and having the technology to properly identify and map make that changes a lot of things in my opinion and again i think it comes down to whatever country has the most power maybe it's not whatever country has the biggest military but whoever can push around the other country is going to get what they want. But we have international, we have the United Nations. Would that not step in and classify of what is legally bound law versus non-law of a border dispute? But that depends on the country listening to the United Nations. I mean, we're going to name names of countries that don't listen to the United Nations. Russia, <laughs> China, China, the United States. All right, my my mistake. China owns the United Nations. My my apologies. Fair enough. Either way, the three biggest countries in the world, we don't really have. They're more suggestions rather than. They're more suggestions, and so if you have enough money and power, you can get around. You can come out on top of these. Is is all I'm saying is that borders have changed hands through a few different ways: fighting for it, buying it using diplomacy to get it. And I don't think I missed anything. Is there another way borders change hands? Land changes hands? I guess I guess technically colonialism, you can quote-unquote find it. So four? Well, uh, from my notes, you have ethics, you have conquest, you have uh, natural boundaries. I, I, I imagine colonialism goes in with war. I, I, I imagine that's just how it is. I, I just, it's not good, but I imagine that that's a subcategory of that category. So I, I, I stick with your initial three, I think is the correct number. Well, we do have peaceful talks of negotiations and trade. Well, that'd be, that'd be diplomacy. Yeah, you're right. That's diplomacy. Okay. Well, sticking with climate change. And so land changes hands three ways. So climate changes borders. Lands are going to change hands three ways. Now climate's going to change it. But how people respond to either keep, lose, or gain land is 
can be solved in those ways. And I really think it just depends on the country. Yeah, no, I agree with definitely it's a case by case scenario. But since we're talking about climate change and we're talking about diplomacy and we're talking about how things are adapting to ever changing lands, I want to talk about should nature play a effect in the adaptation of borders. The main one I'm specifically talking about is the United States and Mexican border. Is this the Mexican gray wolf? No, not necessarily. Um, According to Durham University, an estimated 122 mammal species, not, not all species, just mammals, which is quite impressive, are infected by the U.S.-Mexican border because they're not able to travel, migrate, and adapt to the new climate changes. And since that's such... So physical walls, barriers, uh, chain link fences, military personnel, uh, that's all borders. And it's very interesting to me how physical borders... Because I agree with the initial question you had, Nick, of a wall, does it make you weak or not weak? To me, it says it doesn't make you weak. It's impartial. It's... Honestly, if anything, a strength in mode. You're able to sustain a long enough time of conquest to build a physical wall. But now it's having amazing and negative effects on nature and wildlife. Are we at the point where we don't need physical walls to just allow creatures to change and adapt to stop species from going to to extinction? So the, the question you're asking is, is it worth more to our society to have an undefended border or some kind of new border with technology than it is to allow nature to do what it's going to do. I would not say unprotected border. I would just say a non-physical border. Right. So using like, like you can still have cameras for thermal or noise like we do on the Canada border. Or U.S. military, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So this is a... This is and I, this only wor- this is an interesting anecdote. It only works on the Canada border because no one's really trying to get from U.S. to Canada or Canada to the U.S. Or if they are, they're in such small numbers, doesn't matter. But they have microphones set up along the border because it's a quote unquote undefended border, but it's still heavily monitored. They have microphones that are set up along the border, and not only do they here for people they automatically tune out native species but they detect invasive species that come in so if you say you have like a bug like a bark beetle or something it will detect the frequency that that bug makes and like flag it well i'm thinking of a non-native species so say jaguars jaguars are slowly moving north due to climate change but physical walls stop them from getting to natural territory they would hunt with because the climate has changed where it's make it inhabitable for them southern region, so they have to move northern region. Is that ethical? So first, the I mean, the easiest solution is breed jaguars and put them north of the border. That's in Texas. We have enough wild animals. So I guess the question... So once again, it's you're trying to weigh the danger of doing something for something else, and I feel like that's... It's going to be on a case by case basis, right? So let's say, you know, say it's uh, like you said, the jaguar. It's a pretty. Is it endangered or is it threatened? Where is it at? I think it's just threatened. I don't think it's endangered. So it's threatened. It's not at the end of its, you know, population yet. Jaguars still fuck. That's for sure. Yeah, they're not the so, goddamn I mean, that's panda. Just, <laughs> you know, shit. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's too hard to. You're trying to quantify too many things, and you'd have to look at hard numbers of say. What like what is the danger by doing this? What is the reward? I mean, you'd have to see a pretty specific number there to kind of help make that cost. Now, is it something to consider? Obviously. Should there be things that you could do? Yeah. I mean, I think you could bring jaguars into assisted migration or we put them, allocate them around their quote unquote, what we think of their geographic extent and see how they do. I mean, there's things we can do, obviously, you know, putting up a wall is going to be harmful. I mean, you look at just putting up deer fences along the along certain highways. Is or like in Canada, fences have stopped. You know, caribou migrations. It's borders don't just stop humans, even though deer get around them pretty fucking good. Well, I actually have a middle ground solution, which I think goes for both. Is you don't have a physical border across the entire. I'm just using Rio Grande for an example. Um, cause what Rio Grande is 
100 plus miles, right? I can't, I don't remember the exact length of the Rio Grande. But if you have certain spots where animals can cross and you just put more personnel watching cameras to security so they make sure only animals cross, much like your example with the, with the Canadian border, where you allow allocations of traversing, I think that's a good little middle ground. Yeah, I mean, I, now you just got to give them enough money to be able to do that or technology to where they can have computers do it and people, you know, track that down. I think that's where the issue is. Uh, we're trying to do the most with the least amount of money. Oh, absolutely. Borders is definitely not a cheap subject matter. Uh, I'm not sure what the quite... Well, like we talked features. about, even with Hadrian's Wall, that it was effective only because it was manned. True. It's same with the, the Great, Great Wall. wall it China. had to be manned. A wall with no one watching it is just a just an obstacle, and you can get over obstacles. Yeah, it's just much. It's well, that's that's much like locks on a door in a house. They're a deterrent. They're not necessarily to prevent for people getting in. If people really want to get in, they'll break the window window and get in. Like a physical border, to my opinion, is a deterrent, not a barrier. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's exactly. It's just like a lock on a house keeps the honest people honest. Well, speaking of barriers and climate change. Looks like the map's being redrawn as we live and breathe, Nick. And I am talking about the Arctic. The Arctic, in international law, cannot be owned. But the five countries that border the Arctic all have their eyes on it. These five countries, and any country that wants to mine, dig, station, or land on the Arctic, are subjugated to the exclusive economic zone. Which means, although they cannot own the area... They can dig or use the land with the UN International Seabed Authority's permission. But a few countries, mainly being Denmark, Canada, Norway, Russia, and the United States, have been surveying, investigating, which seabeds are the richest, full of copper, iron, and diamonds. And as the ice melts, scientists estimate, by the way, that by 2100, summers in the Arctic are going to be ice-free, means more time to dig to mine, to investigate, to control, more territory to be divvied up. And these waters, not just for the resources, are important. The time between traveling from Europe to Asia during the summertime when the ice melts in the Arctic will be cut in half. No longer will the shipping containers from Europe or Asia have to go around Africa. They'll just have to sail around Russia and go south. Those are very valuable waters of who owns them. And it looks like the map is being literally divided in our very lifetime and in front of our eyes. I was wondering, Nick, if you came across any of this. I saw a little bit about it, just of how Russia is just biding its time, waiting until it can get in there. And it didn't seem like any other country was as focused on their territory there as much as Russia was. Oh, I strongly disagree. I saw a lot for Denmark, United States, and Canada. I was also, well, then that defeats my point, but my point was Russia's also, fam just like France, famous for losing out on a bunch of really great territory by selling it for cheap, <laughs> so. Didn't they sell Alaska for like $8 million? It, something crazy, like a four cents an acre or something like that. Boy, if I... Everyone, anyone who in the world who wants to sell me four cents an acre, just uh, just let me know. But to me, this is very interesting, Nick, because this is land by law. We were not allowed anyone in the world to own or to claim. But as climate change happens, it's becoming more and more prevalent that these will become international waters, and that claiming it, claim it's like another, it's giving another gold rush, claiming your stake. Is going to be very important. The main one for me is, yes, the resources. Main, uh, forget the diamonds. I'm more curious about the copper, the phosphate, the night, uh, the iron, stuff like that. But I'm even far more curious on the transportation routes. Think about how much money the Silk Road made, on how that changed borders, on how Constantinople became a major city because the borders all led the con uh, the the trade to them. And I imagine the Arctic's going to be very similar to that. Yeah, probably. I mean, once, say you can, uh, I mean, it really depends though, because it's so protected right now. It's just hard to see 
what it's going to look like in the future. Like, are we going to have airports all over it or, you know, are we not going to? I mean, it's, I, f- it's, I feel like it's hard to say. Well, if I remember collect- correctly, 20% of the world's natural gas and oil is still underneath the Arctic. And what we've gone to get oil and natural gas in today's world is wars. And I can see being a war over rights and claims in, in the Arctic. Oh, yeah, probably. I mean, I, I don't doubt it. I mean, as soon as someone finds something they want, they'll be they'll either probably first try to get it through diplomacy or bullying. And if that doesn't work, there's going to be a conflict. And the Arctic is just the next place. One of the next place. Besides, well, I'll let you take this where I think you're taking it. Well, I was going to say planets and moons. That's exactly where I thought you were going. Yay, bringing it back to space. Well, according to international law, no government or country is allowed to own any land in international, not international, interplanetary space, which I call bullshit. As soon as we're able to put people on Mars regularly, we are 100% putting artillery and a rail gun on there to protect that planet. It is it is definitely colonization all over again. But at least this time there's no inhabitants to murder and slaughter. So it's a little bit nicer colonization. And much like the Expanse, I can see that being divvied up between Mars, uh, the asteroid belt, probably Venus, maybe the moon stuff like that and just like the arctic it's getting closer and closer to the time where it's gonna be a land grab yeah i'm curious which one's gonna go first i i almost feel like space is gonna be the first more of a competition than the arctic at first Ooh, that is a good question because the arctic summer is supposed to be ice free by 2100 so another 80 years 80 years is a long time especially in the space age industry i'm trying to think if I was a betting man, I would say the land claim grand the lamb the land claim grab would be Arctic first, then plant then external planets. I think external planets is such a community based thing still, where even though NASA might be putting rovers on the Mars, it's still an international community almost. Whereas oil Copper and iron is just very more country based. So even if we get to Mars first and start colonizing, I think it'd be very neutral. But as soon as the ice melts in the Arctic, I think it's first come, first serve. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm still thinking. Um, man, I just I agree. The resources that are in the Arctic are probably more pressing. It's just hard to say what our petroleum needs are going to be a hundred years from now. I feel like the the rare earths in space are going to be worth a lot more than than what we can get from the Arctic. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I thought I thought the max level for most planetary items. I'm I'm not talking about digging on a planet. I'm just talking surface level or asteroids. I thought it was iron or lower. And what's iron? Was it forty two or is it ninety two or something like that? One two three four. It's it's a is it it's a D column, right? Right. You got, did you realize how long ago it was that we did space mining? I have no idea. Iron's 26. Okay. Not 40, where I was fucking thinking of. Yeah, I am I thought most planetary stuff, not planetary, asteroid stuff was iron or less. Wait, what's gold? Oh, never mind. That, that defeats the purpose of gold. But gold, never mind. I'm getting into a space tangent. Just, uh, I'm just walking away from that one because I'm going to go down a rabbit hole and I'll never return. But Nick, I don't think we're going to solve any border crisis today. And I don't know if physical borders, borders drawn by foreigners, borders drawn by cultures, borders drawn by history. I don't know which border is the best border. And I was wondering if I can get your opinion on that before we start to wrap this. Which border do you think is the best border? Do you think a border naturally drawn by mountains and rivers, border on a parallel geography-wise being longitude and latitude, a border divided by cultures, so X religion and Y religion, or uh, Z ethnicity and A ethnicity, or some other border way to divide the land? How do you think borders moving forward 
should be divided. So that's, you're asking two separate questions here. So what do I think is the best border of how to divide nations? I think that's probably culturally, right? But you're asking another way to look at that question is what is the best border? And I'd argue something like the U.S.-Mexico border where there's, but the argument would be that's not really a border because there's no real need to cross it. It's You could argue it's different cultures, but it's not that different to cultures. So that's probably one of the best borders because there's no real, they don't want to come over here. We don't want to go over there. So that's a really great border. I mean, land border, borders are pretty good because it's apparent, right? It's not like you're not getting a, your lawyer and your surveyor out to go be like, oh, this is pulling up the Latin long from the description or however the the code, you know, however your treaty is written to figure out your borders. But also if your river, mountain changes, whatever, it's volcano explodes, who knows, then your border's off. And again, I think it all just comes down to, you know, I'd say whoever has the most power, whether it be military or not. Like if you have two neighbors and one guy has a bunch of money and the other guy doesn't and he hires a surveyor and can take the other guy to court for long enough to where it doesn't become feasible for him to defend that it's his land, he's going to get it. <coughs> Iowa and Missouri. <coughs> so, I don't know, It's almost, borders are just, they're kind of arbitrary and they're not arbitrary in the way people are think they're all deep when they say, oh, it's just some line made in the sand. It's like, no, borders are wherever whoever has the most power decides they're going to stop expanding. And if they want to expand, they're going to expand. It's the way we've done it for thousands of years. It's the way we're going to keep doing it. It's the, the biggest border is the border that, or the best border is being inside the most powerful culture. What about internal borders then? Like the Mississippi River changing, which is used by many states to divide their border to how to be. Are we using the old Mississippi River or the modern Mississippi River? Well, whatever state has the biggest economic pool is probably getting the good end of that deal. Or maybe it's not an economic pool. Whoever's got the, the ear of someone higher up. I mean, it all comes down to power, influence, whatever you want to call it. Now, we we could be doing it the right way, right? Of looking at, you know, allocating equally... But I, I just don't think that that's how it's done. Well, it just made me think, who decide... I mean, we had the Supreme Court decide between Iowa and Missouri. Is that is the Supreme Court have to decide on every border dispute between states? Well, it may not I make it to a... the Supreme Court, but it'd probably make it to a federal court to regulate interstate commerce. There's... Mm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to go back a little bit because there's 13 federal circuit courts, right? And I... I'm wondering if that's done by culture or that's done by region or population because that would all affect the outcome of a border dispute between states. Well, in an ideal world, no. In an ideal world, the court justices are going to look at the law and the past examples to give the best ruling decision. All right, Mr. Uh, fairy tale, calm that's down. That's why I said uh, the real world, it's all <laughs> based on power. And whether that's money, military power, political influence, power is what well, decides I, I borders. Just, I just can't help but see, not comparisons, but similarities between Africa and the United States on borderland disputes. I mean... I'll give you an example most of, Illin of... Well, hang on. Let me, let me just say, most of Illinois does not want to be part of Chicago. But because of how the border is drawn, it's how it is. To me, that's very similar to how the Sudanese rebels want part of the Habib Triangle to be part of Sudan rather than Egypt. Yeah, so I was going to give the example of Southern Oregon doesn't want to be part of Northern Oregon. Northern California doesn't want to be part of Southern California. Northern Oregon or Northern California, Southern Oregon want to form together to form the 51st state of Jefferson. It's never going to happen because all of Southern California gets their water from Northern California they have the majority in the state, even though the northern part has done everything they need to all do. All the resources. Has, yeah, has all the resources and everything they need to do legally to try and leave the state. It's not going to be recognized by the southern portion because they have all the people, so they have all the power. Mm. Well, it's interesting to me because you say all the power, but they have all the people, but the northern has all the resources. And my knee-jerk reaction, I know you are correct. 
But my knee-jerk reaction is you have all the resources, you have all the power. But I guess all the power is relative depending on what type of form of government you have or what kind of jurisdiction you use to dictate what type of borders you have. Right. Well, I mean, it's the same problem the United States have been having since the Whiskey Rebellion is how much can the government take before people say that's enough? Or that's the same problem any government's had since the beginning of time. So, yeah, I mean, we're in one moment in history, you know, say the Southern California government keeps taking and taking and taking, and suddenly no one in Northern California can farm or do anything they want to do because the South's taking all their water. You might see a different reaction, but until they affect enough people, yes, the North has all the resources, but who does that affect? Right now it affects, you know, tourism, farming, but that's what, 5% of the total population? Yeah, probably probably. So it's not like really like the whole population. So until that whole population starts to hurt, they can just keep taking however much they want. I don't disagree with you, but boy, it doesn't seem right. Yeah. Well, my, I don't know. my point I'm, hasn't been this is the right way to do borders. This is the my point has been this is the way borders are. I don't know. To, to answer my own question, I I like when they use well, it hasn't worked out when we use longitude and latitude. I mean, you get the DNR between North Korea and South Korea. You get Vietnam. You get Canada and U.S. disputing. Well, that's just because people can't draw a line straight. You get Sudan and Egypt. The idea of a geographical border due to distribution due to longitude and latitude makes sense to me, though I do not think it has been executed correctly. And... I am indifferent to how borders should be made. I think it's a very case-by-case scenario. I think geographically should have an influence, but I do not think it should be the main cause of a border being drawn. An example being like, hey, this ethnic group might be all around this mountain. Let's not use this mountain range as a split. So that's, that's... My answer to my own question is, I guess it goes down to ethnics, ethnical groups, economics, then physical barriers, if that makes sense, Nick. Yeah, I get what you're saying. And I want to say, so you're you're, kind of doing the same thing, right, with Africa, with the United States, where we're saying we're looking at these old borders that meant something back then, right? So, Well, perfect for the United States to go into your sem is, is Protestants versus Catholics or some or Mormons moving to Utah or something like that. Just giving you an easy example. Yeah, but it was a pretty homogenous culture for the most part. Oh, completely agree with that. Statement. So you're there really wasn't that much difference between Illinois and Kansas, Kansas, Missouri. <laughs> like when they were deciding slave and free states, <laughs> any Midwest state. Yeah, when they were deciding slave and free states, because you could only admit one of each of the nation, they just make some states slave states and some free some free states just to even it out. <laughs> It wasn't like this huge, you know, thing all the time. So, but yeah, that was a long time ago. So now look at it, like you talked about the difference between, you know, Illinois being three blue counties and however many red counties, and it's a blue state. Culturally, there's a huge difference there, but it's one border. So how how do we rectify that? And and we talked about this and what do we call it? Sit, urban versus rural? City versus rural? Probably. I'll, I'll be honest, Nick. This is... We're probably over 200 episodes right now at the moment. It's hard to keep them all straight. So we, we talked about the cultural differences between those and and how do you create borders. And so I guess, you know, kind of what Mike's, I don't know if it's what you're getting at or what you're just kind of hinting towards of maybe we need to redraw some borders to deal with the culture. And I guess the question is, how often do we do that? I mean, look at, you know, gerrymandering. We fucking hate when people do that. And supposedly they're doing it for reasons and separating things into cultural areas. I don't think that's exactly what's happening at all. And I'm not saying that because I live in a blue state. It happens in every single state. People decide the borders because they have the power, which is my whole point. Well, if, if I can add a caveat to here, I think it's different if your country didn't get to decide its initial borders versus deciding its natural borders. So using your example of how often, 
the United States should do it far less often than say, I don't know, uh, say say the slave coast in Africa, when I which I don't know what its modern name is. I maybe West Coast, maybe Gold Coast, maybe Ivory Coast. I'm not quite sure. They didn't get to have their initial decision. We did. Our ancestors had the initial decision of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia, which happened during the Civil War. Uh, Florida. We had all those decisions made in a relatively short time in humanity when we were in power. That was not the same across the world. But those decisions so were I think made ri- sometimes earlier than the decisions in Africa you're mentioning. No, no, no. I... But the, the thing is, the decisions made were not done by those in power who live in country. So West Virginia, uh, not West Virginia at the time, uh, New Yorkers at the time got to vote on how to distribute the territory of Florida when Florida came in through uh, Spain to the United States. People who live in the United States gain more of the United States and got to live in the United States. I understand what you're it's saying, a, but either the point you're arguing on both of those is none of the people who live here now got to decide. So I feel like it's the same argument. Like, yes, our ancestors did, but that doesn't relate to the culture well, I think we live a, in now. I think that's very different. I think the forefathers having an, a, having an idea for their children and their children's children, etc., carries on versus if it's a country i've never seen step foot in i care far less than it's a country my people might live in i think those are two very different things those are two different mindsets of one is more important because it's more prevalent and might physically affect my life versus one that's halfway across the globe and i'll never see the reactions from my decisions I get what you're saying, but isn't your point then that the people in Africa should be able to redefine their boundaries because they know better? My yeah, my opinion was if we were to have a date where every, I don't know, century, people had to look at their own borders and see if the borders were keeping up with modern culture, I would say these, these are arbitrary numbers. America, a state like, say, say Kansas— Kansas would look every 300 years, but Ethiopia would look every 100 years. So it's not, it's not a perfect analogy, but it, it is. It's like Kansas has a less of a odds of looking at their territory and changing versus Ethiopia changing. Because I think the beginning stages of a country, state, or territory are far more important than the, the later stages. So if you have the rough map of where your line's drawn, you can figure out the details later. But if you weren't even part of the rough detailing of your territory, I think you kind of get first come of if you have to remap, let's go to the drawing table, let's go to the table and discuss. Africa being a perfect example because they had no say in it, I think they get first at bat to change their territories as long as as their neighbors agree with it because i imagine a lot of their neighbors feel the same way of just like hey we have these ethnic groups we have this culture they're at odds with each other if we separate them or if we naturally have them where they are where certain religions are here certain religions are there that might make borders a little bit more easier than versus you know a country in europe giving another king land in Africa simply because he wanted swampland to hunt. I think those are really different from Kansas of, hey, this was drawn in 1836 versus 1836 in Africa. Those are, to me, two, though the same date, two very different scenarios. I understand what you're saying and the point you're trying to make, but then wouldn't the argument just be, okay, so... Now you change these borders to whatever they should be. Shouldn't everyone be on the same page now? Same page in what way? Okay, so say the Ivory Coast, which got its oldest border in 1889. And let's say some, trying to think of what state that would be. Somewhere in the United States, state borders were done in 1889. It's 2022. So probably like Arizona or something like that. Yeah, it's 2022. Both countries redo their borders based on what the people inside agree and their neighbors agree. Then 
when they both be on that hundred year, like, okay, we decided and now it's the next generation's turn to decide the borders? No. All right. So one, I want to point out the caveat that internal territory versus external territory is different. But sticking with your example, I imagine the equations are different. So if I have y is equal to x squared plus 2, I will have a much more exponential uh, parabola than I if I had x squared minus 1. But giving enough time and enough numbers, they'll eventually get pretty relatively close. And I think it's the same way. So say a country that was colonized and didn't decide its own per- borders by its own people, they do it first, followed by... So it's tit, tat, tit, tat, tit, tat, but not an equal rate, not one to one. Maybe it's, maybe the group A gets one times three. So like the first three years, that being the three, they get to do it. And then the other one gets to start and eventually they'll become almost with enough time universal, if that makes sense. To to have the graph so I understand though they do not what you're saying is you're saying like that uh the say like the United States state was starting out with a leg up and so it's already at you know whatever higher number than the Ivory Coast and because so once they get their quote unquote new borders they're going to have a settling in phase where then they're going to feel like okay we advance this much now we this doesn't work for us anymore. It works or continues to work for us. Whereas whatever state in the U S has already advanced past that point of knowing its own borders so that it will say, be like, okay, like, yeah, this, 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 you know, fits or doesn't kind of Goldilocks situation. This is a really dumb analogy. And again, this is an analogy, but say Ethiopia gets three generations before United States gets one generation. And then it's a one-to-one ratio, you know, just, I think it's a huge asterisk for a country where the people, the ethnics, the groups, the religion, the X, Y, and Z didn't get to decide its own borders. I think there needs to be some balancing in the equation because for the most part, Americans in the United States got to decide its own borders, at least for relatively for the most part. I would not say that's the same. With Asia, South America, or Africa. But Asia kind of settled its source out. South America, I have no fucking clue. South America is like a black hole to me. It, I, it confuses the hell out of me. Africa is a little bit more easier example. To me, it seems like you didn't get to decide. We'll let you... It, it's like... it's like uh, I don't know if you follow hockey, Nick. But the, the Knights, the Golden Knights, or whatever they're called now. Um, when the new hockey team got formed in professional hockey... They all got like the first round pick and like a member of each team. It, uh, it's they get a little bit of a balance and then it's all even across the board. So balance it out so everyone's on the same page and then it's completely even. It's not the perfect analogy. It's not probably the perfect scenario, but it's what comes to my mind relative to what we're talking about. I mean, I I agree. I just I. I see your point. Oh, I don't. I, I don't, know, don't know. I don't what, say it's possible. I just say it'd be great. I just don't understand. Like, is there somebody? Is there an international committee saying you can only rearrange your borders this many times? I imagine the jurisdiction, the nightmare of trying to come up with a border, and also how many more prevalent issues a country has to deal with besides the changing the border is far more prevalent but that being said maybe some of those issues would go away so maybe some of the countries in the west coast which are having farming issues due to overfishing if they were to rearrange their borders so they had more inland so they could have some more mining jobs more mining jobs means less fishing let the fishing market fix itself and it becomes more balanced due to borders alone just because of the territory you have means more different jobs it's not ideal. I'm not saying it's realistic. I'm just wondering if that is a possibility. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand. Yeah. Sorry. Left field. Does 
your does africa have a union like europe like a european union where you're able to, able to travel country to country i know some african countries you have a hard time traveling to country to country but i don't know if does does africa have anything like that no idea okay because i i don't think they do but i'm but i imagine that would change a lot of things as well if you were able to travel for work more easily in africa yeah nick i don't think we're solving the border crisis tonight what border crisis the one that's been going on since the beginning of time yeah that one i don't think uh two fools of the capital f are going to solve it in the span of uh two hours i mean i, I just want to reiterate this the oldest known wall was constructed four thousand five hundred years bce six thousand something years ago this isn't new like <laughs> borders are not new that wall is newer than i thought it would be well, I mean, that's just the oldest. I didn't really look for the oldest one, but at least 6,000 years ago. But then you look at, like, animals marking their territory. I mean, territorial disputes has probably preceded our fucking language. <laughs> or, I mean, oh, at, look not at English, lions but, like, alone. The, the, our, the human form of communication before Homo sapiens. Yeah, I was going to say, I would say my money is on there's been territories before humans were bipedal animals yeah so no we're not going to solve it that's some of the history of it some of the origins of borders i guess of, of how it's affected humanity and i mean I, I just before we get out of here i want to talk about three instances that really changed borders around so the 1815 congress of vienna after the napoleonic wars made the formalization of a lot of those boundaries the uh, treaty of versailles after world war one also formalized a lot of boundaries. And then after World War II, a lot of boundaries became formalized as well. And it, there's just weird times where all of a sudden, like, nation after nation gets its boundary, quote-unquote, formalized. I just thought that was pretty interesting that a lot of countries can tie their, European countries can tie their borders back to those three events. If I could add to that, just internationally, it's always weird to me how much borders change. It, I coming into this episode, Nick. I'll be honest with you. I pretty much thought borders were defined either by nature or by war. I thought there was no middle ground. But it's shown to me that humans, once in a while, are capable of going to the boardroom and having treaties and discussing it like rational humans, rather than killing each other to divvy up land, which gives me hope. Small hope, but because you have countries like Russia and China, but, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Well, you got anything else? No, I was just curious on people listening on how would you solve a border dispute? Because it's a complicated one, and I imagine there are many different ways to do it, but I'd love to hear how other people would settle a border dispute. And where could they tell us, Nick, on if they wanted to settle a border dispute? Well, you can find us on Reddit or Instagram, but I don't really know if they want to settle a border dispute. They might have to go somewhere else. <laughs> no, freedom for all or freedom for none. Free discussion for all, as long as everyone's respectful. And out of curiosity, speaking of being respectful, what book are you reading? I am still reading Wood by Roland Enos, a history of uh, just how trees and Wood products have impacted humanity as a whole from, you know, just making fire to making tools, shelter, all that stuff. What about you? What are you reading? I am getting more deeper into Geometry for Ocelots by Exerbium. And the best way I can describe it still, it's Brave New World meets Alice in Wonderland. It is trippy, but it makes you, it makes you think. Definitely makes you question things, which I like. I would highly so far recommend, and I'm only maybe a quarter or a third of the way in. Well, with that being said, thank you all for listening. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. This probably isn't your first podcast, so you know it helps if you share it or give it a review. And check us out on Reddit, Instagram, or YouTube where we put up more content, have discussions, and you can tell us your thoughts. Thanks for listening.